good morning. Uh, thank you to the organizers for the uh, possibility to speak to you today. And uh, I hope that uh, I'll be able to keep you awake after uh, the exciting dinner last night. Uh, so what I want to speak about is uh, a, some things that I see that we've re really neglected to consider in the uh, black hole evaporation problem. Uh, and I want to uh, characterize some of the things I think we haven't neglected uh, by comparing the black hole evaporation problem with, with uh, uh, another problem in, uh, in classical general relativity, which is the uh, which, I'll, uh, which has become known as the self-force problem. And uh, so it turns out there are very many te similar techniques for these two problems, uh, but there are important differences, and it's, it's the differences where we seem to be stuck. So here's a brief outline. I'll s just say a few words about black hole perturbations, a talk in particular about how we deal with singularities in both the quantum field theory and the self-force calculation, talk about some problems uh, that exist in the self-force calculation, how similar problems exist, uh, philosophically anyway, in the, uh, the, the Hawking problem, but there are different problems that, that I said we haven't solved and we haven't really solved them in close to 40 years now. Uh, so I, underst I expect that not not many people here are intimately familiar with the self-force problem, so I just wanted to say a few words about it. Um, so it's, it's similar to the uh, problem Dirac considered of the radiation of an electron uh, in an, some external field, uh, where here we're, we're typically interested in the uh, radiation uh, from a small object when the external field that it's in is the gravitational uh, field of some large object, like a small black hole, for example, around a large black hole or a neutron star around a supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy or some such thing. So I'm not, I'm not speaking about the, the most familiar problem that's been solved by numerical relativity. I'm speaking about a problem that can't be solved by numerical relativity uh, it's important for, uh, for us to be able to understand the waveforms to expect from LISA-like sources, so sources where uh, in, in a frequency band which is uh, sub-hertz, sub around you know, tens of millihertz. Uh, and uh, it's a problem uh, that, that uh, as a small community that invest much of their time in. Um, so let me, so there are just a few things that, that we need to understand about it. Um, what I will show you in the next transparency is something about uh, the, the way we handle the, the, the fact that there, there's a singularity because we're treating the particle as a point source. But the bottom line is that after we treat the, deal with this particle appropriately, we're left with, in the neighborhood of the particle, a smooth perturbation to the metric, which is not just smooth, but a vacuum solution. So that for, for practical purposes, when we try and figure out what the force on the particle would be, we can essentially take the divergence of this, uh, just as you would in electromagnetism, and that, uh, that's associated, oh, you know, some, some gradient to this, and that's associated with uh, the, uh, excitation that the particle feels away from a geodesic in the background uh, metric G, zero. So it, it essentially becomes a geodesic in this geometry, which in terms of the background, we can describe as uh, being pushed by a force away from the background geodesic. That's about all we need to know about it. Um, uh, except for this last point here, um, so, the way we arrive at, at the understanding we have of the self-force problem is a little similar to the way we have sort of used uh, equilibrium states to understand the quantum problem. 
So although we, we are interested in an evaporating black hole and we're interested in an evolving orbit, we, we don't have calculations that we can fully uh, carry out for an evolving geometry. And so the calculation is carried out typically for an orbit which is either circular or elliptical, but, but which um, doesn't evolve. So if it's an elliptical orbit, it it's, uh, uh, repeats. And once we find the force, well, we could go ahead and evolve the orbit. Uh, that was kind of a separate step. Uh, but so the reasons why that's not the way business is carried out, and the main reason is we're interested in, uh, so for, we're looking at gravitational waves from a, uh, an ordinary star around the center of the supermassive black hole in our galaxy, for example. We'd like to see hundred, we, we'd, uh, a detector that we expect to build and be sensitive to that would be sensitive enough to see the in spiral over about the last year of its duration, and there would be over 100,000 orbits. So we'd be able to see this evolution over a very long period of time. And uh, so we don't really have techniques where we can evolve, uh, even if we calculate this cell force, we can evolve it stably for 100,000 orbits. So we, we do need some other idea. Uh, a typical approach is to, to think of a two-timing analysis. Uh, so we sort of consider this force acting on a, a short time scale and then consider the actual evolution of the orbits on a long time scale. But the, the crucial thing for us is uh, that we can't do. We can't do that at present. And uh, similarly in the uh, black hole problem, we, we can't calculate quantum states in uh, with any an evaporating black hole. We know how to calculate quantum states in equilibrium, and we know how to calculate outgoing states from that, but not to include evaporation. So, uh, so I'd like to stress some of this a little more deeply. Some of the similarities between this problem, uh, these two problems. So, in the in the uh, quantum field theory problem. Uh, we're interested in describing the quantum stress tensor, so we need products of fields at a space-time point, and products of quantum fields at space-time points are not regular. And so we have to introduce some way of dealing with that, and uh, one of the most famous methods that that's, was commonly used and has been uh, uh, when these calculations were first done was to essentially uh, take one of the quantum fields at one point and the other one at a slightly uh, neighboring point. So this is uh, the so-called uh, point splitting method that Steve Christensen introduced. Uh, and then we used all our knowledge about Green's functions, which we can write as products of fields, and most of the time we're interested in Green's functions where the points are not the same. We know if we put the points together, we get some kind of delta behavior for the, for the Green's function. So we're interested in Green's functions, uh, w which we can write as products of, of <coughs> ordinary fields. And so a lot of our understanding about how to deal with this uh, quantum problem came from uh, basic knowledge about Green's functions uh, for classical fields. Uh, so one of the things that's, that's very different in the, the quantum problem from uh, what I'll say about the, uh, the cell force problem, the next transparency, is uh, that for the quantum problem, the results of the, of, uh, of the regularization and the subtraction to get something that's, that's uh, finite to describe this product, that subtraction, uh, which is well defined, nevertheless is different for different quantum states. So in the cell force problem, there's one subtraction. Uh, it's it's you know, given essentially by a ba basic understanding of physics, and that's that. In the quantum problem, we know we have to be sensitive to the state that we're dealing with, and so the subtraction is different for different states, and the result is therefore different for different states. And we know how to specify it uh, in, in a formal way. We don't, uh, we don't know how to characterize uh, what we get from that. And I think, uh, to, to put it in a nutshell, our, our, 
lack of understanding, our lack of work on trying to characterize quantum states uh, is, is something that's still holding us back today. So in the self-force problem, uh, we're, we're not starting with wanting products of fields, we're actually starting with wanting to describe a point particle. And uh, we, we introduce a green, uh, basically a delta function, which can also be characterized as a product of fields uh, to do that. So we, we uh, you know, stupidly, as it turns out, because delta functions are very bad gravitational sources, uh, we introduce a, uh, a, a non-physical source, but then uh, characterize it in such a way that we can extract the physical information. And the regularization, just in the, as in the quantum field theory case, the regularization uh, in the neighborhood of the, sing the point where things are singular is, is uh, purely local. Uh, but, but the thing that I stress here is that after the reg regularization, what's left uh, for this, this perturbometric, uh, which I refer to as H, is actually a smooth vacuum solution. So it's not just any finite metric, it's actually a vacuum solution. Uh, just as you would, you would uh, find if you were doing uh, you know, an electromagnetic problem, you have a bunch of charges and you want to calculate the cell force on this one, or the, you know, the fact that it reacts on itself. If you look at all the other charges, that, you know, they're singular somewhere, but in the neighborhood of this particular one we're interested in, they're just uh, vacuum solutions to Maxwell's, Maxwell's equation, all of, them, all of them. And so the same situation occurs in the self force problem. Uh, so because, because the, if, if one's actually interested in the force, uh, we need to be able to take derivatives then the regularization has to be carried out not only for the metric, but also the derivatives of the metric. Yeah, but is, there, is there a, a pre-acceleration of the derivatives that goes just like in the back? So uh, the way business is done, you don't see that. Um, I think if you solved it in the way Dirac, if you could solve it in the way Dirac did, you'd probably find that. Because um, it still depends on like the third derivative of... Yes, so, uh, so we don't understand that that's real physics. I mean, sorry, we understand that that's not real physics. And so uh, the common way of dealing with that is uh, to do what we call the reduction of order. So, um, so the field depends, you know, the, uh, so the gradient of uh, so let me go back here. Well, I don't want to, you know, derail. Well, I, I, it's but... actually a, an important question, sorry, um, because um, for for the electron problem, if you write it down the way uh, Dirac did it and analyzed it, you end up with this, uh, you know, a third order equation. Right. That's not physics. Uh, we don't we don't see electrons. Uh, we don't see runaway solutions and things like that. So it's not physics. What's the correct theory? We, we actually don't know. But right. it's, it's so, definitely I mean, not that. The, the usual resolution is if you rule out the runaway, then you get pre-acceleration, but the duration of the pre-acceleration is less than the light travel time across the classical radius of the electron. And so you wave your hands and say, in, in a quantum treatment, it would all be smeared out in some right. way. Right. So the real, so what we believe the real pro, uh, solution is, is that we should be dealing with quantum theory. Yeah. Using uh, Feynman graph. Any version you like. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, but of course, uh, so I'm, I'm not arguing that we need quantum gravity in order to solve the cell force problem, but. But, uh, I, so this is an approximate approach, uh, and we don't have an exact theory that, that we can, well, we have, we do have the Einstein equations, but, uh, which for this problem we could treat as exact, but doing computations in it is not something we can do exactly, and that's why we're, we're looking at such 
approximation schemes. But the, so, for example, the, the argument about pre-acceleration is not something we can measure. We can argue that it's too small to see, but we, we can't prove that that's actually what happens. Right. So, what I described for the self force problem, I described the first order perturbation analysis, and uh, if we evolve it, then we look at how the, the change in the metric changes due to the change in the metric, so we're really looking at things at second and higher order. And uh, so essentially that's similar to the problem we have with talking evaporation. We know how to do the perturbative calculation, but uh, say for where the geometry is fixed, but not how to do the perturbative calculation where the geometry is responding to the quantum field, uh, at least not completely, where the geometry is responding to the quantum field that's been uh, produced by the particles. So what do we actually do uh, for the, uh, the Hawking radiation problem? Um, so I'd say generically we, uh, we try and arrive at an understanding of what the quantum stress tensor should be. We either use uh, purely numerical methods or analytic approximations or modeling to do that. Uh, the purely numerical methods uh, can be carried out in a few special cases. Uh, which we can sort of number on one hand. One case is the equilibrium case. Um, one case uh, would be the purely uh, outgoing radiation case, and they're the only ones th that's enough for us to think about here. But in particular, we can't do it where the, uh, for the black hole, we can't do it where the, the geometry is changing in time. Uh, as I'll remark uh, a little later, the sort of technique that Leonard Parker was uh, mentioning yesterday uh, may actually tell us things that we haven't understood how to apply to this problem yet. So, so the 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 only way that we can can solve the 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 quantum problem with, with some kind of exactness, even if we're making these simplifications like it's an equilibrium state or it's a purely outgoing state. The only way we can solve it with some kind of exactness is purely numerically. And uh, so what Jim Bardeen was talking about is, is trying to extract some kind of information from those purely numerical results in terms of uh, series expansions. But there's a whole lot of information in that numerical uh, result that we haven't really extracted. In fact, we don't know how to. For example, that numerical result uh, includes consequences of both ingoing and outgoing radiation uh, everywhere, no, not just at Scry, but actually up against the horizon, uh, in, even in the equilibrium case. Uh, but we don't have a way of teasing out, you know, how we could characterize something that we're from the, the calculations that we can do exactly. We don't have a way of teasing out what part of the result is associated with an ingoing flux of negative energy and what part of the result uh, is associated with an outgoing flux of positive energy. So we struggle with that. Uh, we put in, uh, we typically put in some ingoing flux to make a calculation work, like the sort of thing that Laura was talking about on Monday. We put in some ingoing flux, but the, uh, the quantum state that we have information about ha hasn't uh, been obtained with that flux as part of the description. Uh, and that's very important. So, so we're basically missing vital information. So the things that we do use to understand the quantum state, well, we use conservation of energy, we use some space-time symmetries. If we're dealing with Schwarzschild, we can use spherical symmetry. Uh, we use quantum calculations to know that there's a trace anomaly. 
And these in four dimensions uh, give us uh, less than complete information. So there's one degree of freedom that we can't, uh, that we don't have information about from putting in those physical and, and quantum considerations. In two dimensions, uh, it turns out that, that we don't have, uh, that we can solve the problem, uh, we, we don't have one unknown. But in four dimensions, we have one unknown. And so everybody who carries out an evolution is, has dealing with the fact that they have some unknown in some way. So Laura has a way, uh, uh, people before her like Spi Peran when he did a calculation, uh, has a way, uh, some way of approximating the fact that we're missing information in such a way that you can carry out a calculation. But I mean, in 40 years, we haven't understood what, you know, what, what characteristic behavior that information uh, is deriving from the quantum state. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I imagine some of the things that we need to do are, are basically do very, very simple experiments, like, uh, you know, t take the numerical calculation of some simple equilibrium problem and, and try and so the true, the quantum state can be written, you know, if, if we have ingoing and outgoing radiation, it can be written as the linear superposition. Can we you know, find a way to extract? If we describe the ingoing radiation as purely thermal, for example, does that, is that enough information to actually split the two and understand it? I don't know. But we need to ask questions like that because we're missing the information and making assumptions or, or putting in, you know, s modeling it just so that we can get on with business is fine to get on with business. And, you know, it's very interesting to see the re results that uh, Laura has been able to get, uh, you know, by adding also uh, a, a specific model of the interior. Um, but uh, we don't know that uh, that sort of calculation will have the same features that, that interest us right now uh, if we had a better understanding, if, you know, if we used a different way of characterizing the information that's currently missing. Okay. So I argue that we need to understand the quantum state properties better than we do. Uh, so, and so we, um, what I think we need to do for that is, is basically to make model problems. Uh, so Yoma was speaking about a, a, a lot of simple model problems. Uh, but we, uh, and most of the ones he was able to demonstrate, in, in his case, things that were interesting, even with a flat space background, we are stuck with having to work in curved geometry. Uh, so we need to find model problems that we can you know, solve, whether it's numerically or not, but uh, with, uh, where varying the parameters in the model problem allow us to intuit something about how those parameters uh, control things. So I would, so we only have, as I said, we have, we have exact results only for numerical calculations and for a very restricted number of problems. Uh, and uh, I would argue that even, even things like characterizing those numerical solutions with series expansions hasn't really given us any insight into how uh, to treat different problems, like how to treat evaporation as opposed to a fixed geometry, a fixed time-independent geometry, which is uh, what both the Huddle-Hawking state and the Unruh state are obtained in. They're in a fixed time-independent geometry. So, uh, and so one of the, these experiments, I would argue, would would. Uh, we would want to understand how the ingoing flux and the outgoing flux contribute separately to whatever the quantum state is that that uh, we are using. So, we, you know, I, I, 
I come back again to the sort of problem that uh, uh, Leonard was discussing yesterday. So suppose we have a black hole. And for some long period of time, it has a certain, uh, let's say, an un uh, uh, understate outside it. And then we push in a little bit of, of uh, negative energy radiation, so we change the horizon. So now it becomes a time-dependent geometry. We can use the kinds of approaches that Leonard has looked at. And then for the rest of its eternal life, it's, it's a, a smaller black hole. So we go from one state to another. We make a tiny change. It's determined only by a chosen amount of negative ingoing flux. And maybe we have to fiddle with the, with the unruh vacuum a little bit outside. So we need to add some change flux uh, from that point also. So there's a model problem. Uh, there are people in this room that are just delighted in calculating model problems like that, and we don't know what the answer is. And, and uh, I, I would argue that, that simple things like this are going to inform us in ways that are really crucial for us to be able to uh, deal directly with the evolution problem rather than these approximations of fixed backgrounds. So I guess the, the last point I, I want to uh, spend a little bit of time is just uh, the effect of vacuum polarization. So uh, it turns out that, that uh, the, the consequences of uh, vacuum polarization near the black hole mean that we can have energy densities which are negative. And these are crucial for understanding the fact that singularities may not, may not even form in the space-time because uh, negative en energy density violates the, um, the conditions for the singularity theorems of, of Hawking and Penrose, so we may not need to worry about singularities. Um, so when we're not in a state yet where we know how to use that information I mean, it's there, we can calculate that the energy density is negative close to the horizon. We're not in a state where we can use that information and, and uh, therefore uh, understand directly why we, we don't even need to think about it space-time with a singularity. All our models uh, keep on referring to models of black holes. So, so maybe the geometry outside is, is fine, is, is uh, spherically symmetric Schwarzschild, that's okay, but uh, uh, somewhere before the horizon, the, the geometry has got to become so different that there, is, there can be no event horizon. It may be necessary to discuss apparent horizons, uh, but there can be no conditions which lead to a singularity. And so it's vacuum polarization uh, that near the black hole which gives us this strange state, uh, but we, we've never been able to figure out how, how to use that, in, even in a semi-classical way. Are, are you thinking about vacuum polarization because of ordinary matter or gravitational vacuum? No, I'm thinking, so any scalar field, you put a field outside a, a or, black hole and matter. calculate its uh, stress tensor, the T00 is negative. Close so, to the horizon, and in a finite domain, it's not two plus epsilon. It's you know between two and three. So it's in a domain w which Jim Bardeen was saying is important. It's definitely important. It's it's not just on the horizon. It's it's in an extended domain, and we've never really pursued what, how that can change the geometry. Now I'll argue it's not easy. People who have tried to to uh, use our knowledge of equilibrium states and, and uh, address, uh, as Laura did and as uh, Svi Paran did many years ago, uh, and look at um, an evolving geometry, always come up against part of the geometry which they can't explore. The, the calculation breaks down in some way. Not the geometry, the calculation. Uh, and that, that was, a, again, a problem in Laura's. The, the exciting part of the space-time is something we were not able to probe. Uh, so we, that's ra very difficult. Uh, and and uh, so it, it's a very characteristic feature of these calculations. And, um, but if, if real physics 
means there is no singularity, then real physics means that the correct equations can be evolved. And that's not what we have, so we know there's something wrong with the physics that gets us to the point where we're stopped. Uh, so those are the points that I'd like to make, and uh, now I'd be interested if, uh, if you have comments or questions. Thank you.